one of the deepest passages in the Bible is between John chapter 14 to about chapter 17, when Jesus is having that last personal chat with his disciples. And, um, you know, there, there are some things there that are almost mystical, and yet they have, they have deep meaning, but it is for us to understand them. So I want to spend some time this morning in looking at the 14th chapter of John. And even though we're all familiar with it, I believe we can be benefited by going back over some of these things and highlighting them. So let me share my Bible, my screen here. And um, I'm going to start right from the very beginning, but I'm, I'm going to go through some of the verses fairly quickly. Jesus begins by saying, let not your heart be troubled. So he's speaking to his disciples because he's, he's saying this to them because he has told them that he's going to leave. He's about to leave them and they are traumatized. I suppose if any of us were, were in their, their position, we would be experiencing the same thing because, you know, these people have been expecting the, the kingdom to be set up. They have been there with Jesus for three and a half years, and they have been preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And just at the moment when they, they are expecting that he's going to take control and establish God's kingdom and overthrow the Romans, he says, I'm going to leave. They are, they are devastated. They are traumatized. As a matter of fact, I don't know what you could say in a, in a situation like this to bring any comfort. I suppose it's like, let me compare it to something in my life. You know, it's like, it's like the morning when I woke up and recognized that my brother was dead. As I've, I, I've told some of you, that is one of the hardest things I've ever experienced in my life. But that morning, what do you want? I want to go back one day. I want to go back one day. I want somebody to work a miracle. I want God to do something that he has never done before and take me back one day in time. I just want one day. And you go through the day in that kind of days and you know that it will, it's gone. It will never happen. You will never have that day. It's kind of like this. The disciples are feeling something like this. All right. Their, their hopes of the last three and a half years, they can't believe what he's saying. And they think that there's some mistake and they are waiting for him. To give them the punchline. They're waiting for him to tell them that he, he didn't really mean it. How do you comfort somebody in a moment like this? And Jesus says, don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. And how do you, con uh, what does he have to say? He says, okay, here's what I'm going to say to you. You believe in God. I'm asking you also to believe in me. Now, they would say, we, we believe in you. We have been following you around for three and a half years. But what he's asking for in this moment is that absolute trust. How do you trust me when I've said the kingdom is at hand? I've given you a message to preach. I know I'm leaving you. I'm asking you to trust in me just like you trust God. Believe that I would not abandon you. Believe that I'm doing this for your good. And so he tries to explain. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Uh, and I don't think he necessarily means dwellings made of gold and, and ivory and marble. I think he's saying there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room in my father's house. There's a lot of, of, of places for you. Okay. I'm not abandoning you. They're, they're, I'm making it possible for you to be where I am. If it were not so, I would have told you, I, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if you ask the question, why is it that for 2,000 years the Lord has not returned? You have the answer right here in this statement. I go to prepare a place, all right? Somehow, in the long delay that we have had since Jesus left, in that long delay, it has been necessary as a part of the process of making it possible for us to be in that place. I mean, of course, none of us is foolish enough to believe that Jesus is gone there to construct, to do construction, okay? I mean, <laughs> that, that, that is for little babies to think like that. He's not doing construction, but there's something that is necessary to make it possible for people from planet Earth to be with Jesus and God in unbroken face-to-face -face fellowship. And right now, the conditions are not yet right. And it's a part of Jesus mission to prepare that place and i suppose a part of that process is also preparing us for that place 
but he gives the assurance. And this is what he's asking them to believe. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. All right, so he's asking them to believe in me, believe what I'm saying. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, you may be also. I think around about this time, the disciples are beginning to realize that what they've been expecting is not going to take place right now. And they are bewildered because what kind of time, what, what time frame are we looking at? How long is this going to take? You know, I, I, left my, I left my job fishing. I left my job as a tax collector. I've been following you around. I, 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 I put everything into one basket. And now you are leaving? How are we supposed to survive? How are we supposed to live? Where are we going to go and what are we going to do? You know, the morning after Jesus died, it wasn't the morning after, it was a few days later. You know what Peter did? He went back to his fishing. Jesus came and came, when, when they were out on the sea catching fish. I mean, he had left his fishing. Jesus called him from his fishing. And now he and John, and I suppose James, they were back at their fishing. They, 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 they had decided to go back to the old life. And then Jesus appeared on the shore. And he said to Peter, when Peter uh, discovered it was him, jumped into the water and came to him. Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonas, Peter, do you love me more than these? He, bro he broke Peter's heart. Do you love me more than these? And when Peter says, yeah, Lord, I love you. He waited a little and he asked him again. And Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. And he asked him the third time. And you know what Peter remembered? He remembered that night when he denied Jesus three times. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me more than these? And his heart is breaking. He says, what can he say? He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. But there's a point that Jesus was making. But anyway, the point I'm making is that Jesus, they, they are beginning to realize that they have a long wait. They are beginning to realize this. And Jesus is saying everything that he can say to calm their humanity and to help them to bear it. And that's what these passages, that's what this passage in John is about. 14, 15, 16, 17. It's about Jesus trying to prepare his disciples for the shock and to help them to be able to bear this delay, this, this, this extraordinary thing that they never expected that he would die. And that and that having having died. They, it would not be all over. They would still have some hope, something to hang on to. Now, interestingly, he says in the next verse, verse 4, and whither I go, where I go, you know, and the way you know. Which of you know the, knows the way to heaven? Is there anybody who knows the way to heaven? Um, when I was a child, I, I believed it was somewhere up there in the Milky Way, right? Then um, at one point, I focused on Orion. Because they say there is this great open space in Orion. I, I, I figure it's somewhere out there. But Jesus is not talking about the, that at all. He says, where I go, you know. And you know the way to where I'm going. In actual fact, when Jesus is talking about the way or the place, he's really speaking about a, 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 a condition, not about a place. Because look at what he says. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we do not know where you go. you are going. We know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Thomas is constantly like all the disciples. And I suppose it's natural because they are, they are only poor humans. They are, they are constantly interpreting Jesus' words in a literal way. They are, they, are, they are expecting him to give them a map. To say that you, when, when, you, when you get down to Galilee, you take a right turn or you cross over uh, those mountains and you're going to, and he's, they're expecting a map. Okay. And Jesus says, Again, in, in his mysterious way, I am the way. If you are the way, how do we walk you? How do we get on the road? I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And then he says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So what is the destination? The destination is the Father. So when he says, 
where I am going, you know the destination is the Father. And when he says, the way you know, the road is Jesus Christ. So that's what he's talking about. He's not speaking about a literal place, at least in, this, in these verses. He's not speaking about a literal place or a literal path to get there. And yet, it, it, it's, it's, it's a real way and it's a real place because the place is the Father. And it, it's very profound and it's very deep because what, what, do, what can we get from this? One of the lessons that is of, of great value is that, um, you know, somebody once said, somebody once said, heaven, here's a definition of heaven. Heaven is a ceaseless approaching unto God through Christ. Heaven is a ceaseless approaching unto God through Christ. In other words, heaven is not being defined as a, a place, a location. Heaven is being defined as a state or a condition. And the reason why I like this very much is because it means that I can be in heaven today. All right? Those of you who really love the Lord and who have enjoyed his company, you know what I'm talking about. All right? Um, there's a little poem I read once that begins something like this. The streets of gold won't dazzle me. Bright, bright scenes won't, won't catch my eye. Anyway, it goes on to say, what, what I'm really looking for when I get there will be to see God, will be to see Jesus. And, and it is true that this is the, the, the way of the heart that really is in love with the Lord. I, I, can, I, I can go to, I can go to um, India and I can see the Taj Mahal, Taj Mahal. I think that's in India. I can go to different places and see magnificent things. If I want to see marble, I can go to China and see the Great Wall. What does that do except to fill the senses until you lose the memory? What is the meaning and the joy of life? And Jesus pointed to it when he says, the destination is the Father, and I am the way. And so all of us, have a clear path laid out before us. What should, we be, what should we be aiming for? What is our purpose in life as Christians? Our purpose is God. Like, like one of the, the reformers, one of the, the early Christians from the days of the, of the Reformation. I think it, it's in the document called the Westminster Confession. I think that's where it is. But there's a statement that says, my goal is God himself. Not joy, nor peace, nor blessing, but himself, my God. Beautiful. And I, I, I wish and pray that all of us might find that this is the echo in our heart. My goal is God himself. That's what I want. I mean, it's easy to get confused because there are so many religious voices. And there are so many distractions in the world today. But ultimately, what is the purpose of life? We were made for God, and our souls will, will forever be restless till we find rest in him. That's the truth. So whether we are here in earth, in the middle of a pandemic, whether we are involved in, in, in a situation in America where there's about to be an explosive election, whether or not we are in a time of poverty and crises and financial distress all over the world, what does it matter? Because Jesus has made it possible for us to arrive at our destination. He is the way and the destination is God. So, he goes on to say, If you had known me, you should have known my father. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. And of course, Philip says, I'm sure it's the father and it suffices at us. And Jesus makes that sublime statement. Have I been so long with, time with you, Philip, and yet you have not known me? He that had seen me had seen the Father. I, I count this one of the great statements of the Bible. There are some that I love, but statements like this really, they, 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 they fill me with an inner glow. You know why? I can know God. I can know God. I can read those hard places in the Bible. 
that are so difficult to understand and I can read around them and I can understand. Last night we were talking about this statement where, where God says that, um, you know, the, the Israelites in, in Deuteronomy 14 and verse 21, I believe, where God said to the, the Israelites, they should not eat anything that died of itself. Roadkill or whatever, something falls in the field. But you can you can give it to the stranger or you can sell it to the alien. And we were we were dis we were discussing this. But one of the things is that you can look at something like this and you can say, I don't understand it perfectly. You can look at a statement like where Paul to uh, like where God tells Saul to slaughter the Amalekites and to leave nothing alive. And it's a hard statement. But you can say, even if I don't understand, I will understand. But one thing I know about God is that I have seen God in the face of Jesus Christ. God's final statement about himself is the face of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews 1, it says in verses 1 and 2, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And it does not mean, some people interpret this to mean that God no longer talks through prophets. The only person that he speaks through is Jesus. And so we must listen to what Jesus says. This is to so completely misunderstand the word of God. It means that in the time past, God tried to make himself known. God tried to speak or to make himself known through prophets. Third hand parties. Fourth hand. You don't get much of an accurate picture when you are, you are hearing something third hand, fourth hand. There's a game we used to play um, called gossip. You make a line, make a circle with, with 20 people or so. And then one person whispers something in the ear of the next person. And then you go right around the circle and everybody keeps whispering what he hears. He's only allowed to say it once. So um, he whispers something and it was always interesting. By the time you got to the end of the 20 persons, what came back was completely different from what the person started with it's an expression of uh, uh, it's an illustration of how of what happens when you, you you pass on things second hand third hand fourth hand and through the prophets god was speaking through secondary tertiary he was speaking through people on, a, on, a, on an inferior level god could never make himself known perfectly in people who were not of his kind so finally god said I, I, i'm tired of secondhand knowledge i am going to speak through my only begotten son who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person you can go look at jesus and you can take that to the bank that is what god is Hallelujah. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, these are, these are some of the precious passages. It says, it says in verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts. Hallelujah. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So, so, so Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. How do you say? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And how do you say then, show us the Father? All right, so that is one of the great truths. And I'll tell you, there are times when we don't understand things. I know that there is, there is a lot in the Bible that we still need to understand. But look here. No matter how hard it is or how difficult, you know one thing we can be certain of. When we look at God in the face of Jesus Christ, what do we see? We see love inexplicable. We not only see love, because, because sometimes for some people, love is a, is a principle. Love is a principle, okay? Sometimes for many people, love has a, has a stern face. It does what is right, but it is stern faced. And for some people, their concept of love is that love does not bend. 
it is a it it, it 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 does what needs to be done but it does not bend it does not compromise when i look at jesus i see love in a completely different way i see love that has emotion i see love that has sympathy and empathy i see love that has i see love that cares i mean one of the most amazing things in the bible is a statement jesus wept you ever think of God as crying? You think God can cry? You think God can cry? And crying for what? Jesus was going to Lazarus's tomb and he was going to raise him from the dead. Why does he cry? I tell you why he was crying. He saw all the people weeping and his heart was moved with sympathy for human sorrow. And Jesus cried. It's kind of like I'm watching a movie. Or I'm reading a story, um, they, they pass around these stories sometimes on, on the internet. And you read a story about somebody who makes a great sacrifice or does something that is very, very stirring. And, and tears come to your eyes. It's something like this was happening to Jesus. Okay. When you look at Jesus, you're seeing God in the form of a human being. You're looking at God on my level. Jesus knew empathy. Jesus knew sympathy. He knew how to how to be be kind to the woman that they caught committing adultery on the Sabbath that they brought before him for her to be stoned. He knew to be diplomatic and tactful and not to disgrace people in public. That is God. That is God. And when it comes to those hard places in the Old Testament where it talks about all the killing and all the slaughtering, John and James read those passages. And their concept of God was based on those passages. And so one day, Jesus was wanted to go through Samaria, and they would not allow him to pass through. The people in Samaria blocked him. They disrespected him because he was, he, he, he was going to Jerusalem. And they wanted, they felt that they were God's people, and he should stop in Samaria, but he was going to Jerusalem. And so they would not allow him to pass through. And James and John, feeling the power that was in Jesus, he said, Lord, just tell us to go call on some fire on them. Because Elijah did it. Tell us to call on fire on them. You know what Jesus said to them? You don't know what kind of spirit you have. You don't know what kind of spirit you have. And I suppose they might have said, Lord, it's the same spirit that was in Elijah. Elijah did it. It was the same spirit that made Saul slaughter the Amalekites. It was the same spirit. In the Old Testament, God was speaking through men in veiled symbols and par parables. You don't get the true face of God until you see that face in Jesus Christ. And it's not my theme today, but sometimes when I get onto this topic, I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't stop, I can't pass by without spending a little time because it's most precious. The greatest thing I ever learned hallelujah. about God. Yes, hallelujah indeed. The greatest thing I ever learned about God was that I can find him in the face of Jesus Christ. When I found him there, I was satisfied. Those hard places, I will understand. I will understand one day, but everything I understand will be in harmony with what I see in the face of Jesus Christ. So, he goes on to say, now this is, this is, this is a, a, an amazing thing. In verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name i will do it look at these three verses i was reading this morning and i was i was severely challenged because i could look at my experience and you could look at your experience and say this is not true jesus says we should do greater works we would do greater works than those that he did and he gives a good reason. He says, because I'm going to my father and whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the father may be glorified in the son. Anything you ask in my name, I will do it. 
we are challenged by these statements. But when I look at it, where, where do I focus my attention? I'm going to show you where I focus my attention because there's always a reason. And it begins right at the beginning where Jesus says, he that believeth on me, he that believeth on me. That's, that's the one condition in the passage. That's the one condition that can explain why there is failure. If you see anything else, please point it out to me. But the rest of it, they, they, are, not, they are not open for discussion. I shall do. I go to my father. I will do that the father may be glorified. That is, that, that is unconditional. That has nothing to do with, there's no possibility of failure in, in those parts of the sentence. The only place where there is room for failure is in this first statement. He that believeth on me. And what it says to me is that we need to really examine more closely this concept of believing in Jesus. If, if you look at the first verse that we read, verse verse, Jesus says, you believe in God, believe also in me. And remember what, what, what I said when we were looking at this verse. I said, what he's asking them to do is to have that confidence in him. Why is he asking for this? Because they're going to pass through some very negative outward circumstances. He's going to die. He's going to be taken away from them. They're going to be persecuted. Everything is going to look dark at times. He says, believe in me. And what he's asking them to do is to place that absolute trust in him. I think all of us believe in Jesus in a limited way. I think we believe that Jesus is the son of God and we can prove it. We know the truth about the Godhead. But to believe in Jesus means, in this sense, means to commit yourself to him, to trust in him, absolutely. And I think this is where all of us, I think this is where all of us have not yet experienced the fullness of what this means. I can think of moments in my life when I, when I kind of stepped into this experience briefly. When I decided to become a minister, when I decided to, go, to, to become an independent minister, I gave up my job as a teacher, okay? I think at that time I made a sacrifice. I think when I think back on it, I don't know how, I don't know how. Because when I think back on it today, it appears bordering on crazy. But I realized that my communication with God was so constant. I was able to do it. I, 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 I had a wife. I had three children, I was paying rent, and I left my job. And I, didn't, I had no idea how I was going to live. I didn't have a ministry at the time. I didn't have, well, there was one person, one little, one, one little old lady who was sending me $100 each month. And that was the only income that I had. And um, I think back on it and I realized that in, 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 this is one time when I really put myself in the hand of Jesus and I said, live or die. I, I'm in your hand. And I remember that the thought that came to my mind was, the worst that can happen to me is that I can die. And, and, I, and I thought, if there is no God, let me and my family die. If there's no God, let me and my family die. But if there is a God, it is impossible that we should not be taken care of. And I'll tell you something, I needed that because for, for, for the first six months, my, my, my sister-in-law's father, he used to have a phrase. He used to talk about going through hell bareheaded. And um, for the first six months, I can tell you that it was like I passed through hell bareheaded. Things are so difficult. And yet it, it was a time in my life when I had the greatest testimonies. It was a time when I, I saw God's hand in every meal that I ate. I saw God's hand. In the, in the uncomplaining attitude of my wife, I saw God's hand. 
in, in the fact that we, we, we had, were able to pay the rent every month, I saw God's hand. And, and, and so I have a little bit of an idea. I have a little bit of an idea, but I still realize that where is the kind of heart for anybody to take those kinds of chances with Jesus today? Where is the heart to take those kinds of steps? I mean, I'm not saying that, that is just one aspect of life. I'm not saying I'm expecting anybody to get up and leave your job. That was my calling. But what I'm talking about is committing yourself to God in such a way that the things that you feel you depend on, the things that you feel you can't live without, those little questionable things, those little things that you know are not really helpful in your spiritual life, you still kind of hang on to them. Maybe maybe a friend that you can't let go. I mean, little things, maybe are big things, maybe. It's not particular things. It's the attitude of mind I'm talking about that says, no matter what happens, no matter what strange path it takes me on, I am trusting in Jesus. It's something like this that Jesus was asking for. When he says, if you believe in me, if you can commit yourself to me and trust yourself in my hand, anything you ask, I will do it. And you can understand, brothers and sisters, because at, at that point, you're not really living your life. You are living Jesus' life. Or I should say, Jesus is living his life through you. So how can it be possible for you to ask something and he not do it when it is he actually asking through you? If you see what I mean. <clears throat> then he goes on to say, if you love me, keep my commandments. I know that um, many people are fond of saying that they, they, at this point, they stop to emphasize the Ten Commandments. But I, I don't think at all that Jesus is focusing on the Ten Commandments here. There's not a hint or a clue in the passage that he's doing anything of the kind. In, in this passage, he emphasizes one thing more than any other. And probably uh, we could just look at it quickly, just to certify that point. Um, in verse, in chapter 15, is it? He says it again in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. But here's what he says in two verses later. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. In other words, when he talks about his commandments here, he is he's emphasizing something in particular. He's not just talking about these 10 principles, and I'm not knocking the 10 principles by any means, I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm saying that we need to read what Jesus says in context and to be fair and reasonable. He identifies clearly that his commandment, what he's focusing on is the commandment that we love one another as he has loved us. So, so with this in mind, and I, I admit, I admit, if there is any place in my life that I have failed, it's in this particular area. I, I have been, since I became a Christian, for most of my time, I have been morally upright, most of my time. And for most of my time, I have endeavored to do the things that a Christian should do. Avoid doing certain things, read my Bible, preach the word. But many times, I have felt that the way my love is expressed for others is not as Jesus' love was expressed. Okay, and, and maybe, maybe I'm speaking for most of us. Maybe I'm speaking for most of us. Jesus knew that Jesus was, was, not, was not saving a person. He was saving a church. He was saving a body. He was saving a, a collection of people. He was saving a world. That's what he wanted to do. And, and he recognized that the one binding agent, the one thing that makes us close to one another and that makes us become what attracts people and what testifies of who he is, is this element of genuine love. When you read about the things that genuine love does, love hides a multitude of sins. Love, love is, not, is not 
quick to condemn. Love is not quick to find fault. All the things that Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. And so where there is love, a fellowship can survive. That's why I'm kind of glad that although we have some little moments when we disagree in this particular fellowship, we have been able to tolerate each other and to love each other and to disagree. And so far, we have been able to continue. So I, I hope that that spirit may grow and increase. I know that there are some things that we just can't live with. If somebody comes in here and begins to be critical of Jesus, I don't think we're going to make it. If somebody comes and denies some of the fundamentals, like Jesus was not really the Son of God, we're going to have problems, all right? But at the same time, within certain limitations, we're going to be brothers and sisters, and we're going to love one another. But I'm encouraging us to, 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 to cherish and to nurture that spirit, because Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he means these particular things that he says, in particular, this commandment to love one another. And he says, the condition is, if you love me, keep my commandments. And consequently, I will pray the Father. I'm going to ask my Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Context again, another comforter. Why? Because this particular one is leaving. Jesus is leaving them, all right? He's leaving them and they are thinking, you're going to leave us to our own resources? We have been there before. Before the last three and a half years, we were living our own lives. We were without you and we didn't do very well. All I could do was catch fish. All I could do was cheat people out of their money when collecting taxes. They're, they're, they're not looking forward to going back to that. And Jesus says, I'm not leaving you alone. If you walk in the way I ask you to walk, I'm going to send another comforter. And this one is not going to leave you after three and a half years. This one is going to stay with you forever. Wow, I suppose if they believed in Jesus right at this time, they would have begun smiling. But I don't think the full impact of it is reaching them yet. All right? Because he says, I'm going to give you another one like myself, and he's going to stay with you forever. No crucifixion, no going away. And he explains. Who this is the spirit of truth the world cannot receive the world cannot receive nor know this spirit because it seeth him not neither knoweth him and then he drops that million dollar statement but you know him because he's living with you he's living with you and he's going to be in you a profound statement and if if, if they are kind of confused at this time they have a right to be because he says, I'm going to send this comforter. So clearly he has not yet arrived. And then he says, he's living with you. So clearly he has arrived and shall be in you. What exactly is he talking about? And it is only as you understand that Jesus is here speaking about his other self. What we call his alter ego. And if you don't understand the nature of an intelligent being it's a problem but when you come to understand that we are made up of body and spirit body and spirit you begin to get an idea of what he's talking about at first it was a little difficult for me to um really look at this and say is this what he's really saying to accept it superficially but when you look at how the bible in general the bible writers speak about a person's spirit it's not so hard to understand when you go to first corinthians 2 and verse 11 look at this statement we are familiar with it but i want to read it again look at what paul says for what man knoweth the things of a man which man knows the things of a man what is he referring to as the things of a man save or accepting the spirit of the man which is in him let me see how that reads in the NIV. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? See how Paul kind of 
separates a person from his spirit. You have a person and you have the thoughts of the person. Who knows the thoughts of the person? Well, the person's spirit inside of them knows the thoughts. He, he makes the person's thoughts different from the spirit of the person. The spirit of the person has an awareness or a knowledge of the thoughts of the person. So it's almost making you the person into two different entities. And he says, in the same way, or even so, nobody knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. You see, he's almost making God and his Spirit into two different entities. And the Bible treats a person and his Spirit in this way. But as we come to understand, we understand that it's not two different persons, it's two different aspects of the same person. And this is one of those million dollar verses that make us know clearly that the Spirit of God is not a separate entity from God. It's another aspect of God. So this is what Jesus is talking about here in John chapter 14. He's talking about another aspect of himself. That's what gives us perfect understanding of this passage. Another aspect of himself. So different that he's referring to it, to it as another comforter, another comforter, and yet he goes on to explain he is living with you. This comforter who has not yet come is living with you because Jesus was there with him. His spirit was there with him, with them, but that spirit was inside of Jesus. That spirit could not then be living in any of them because it was not possible. Jesus had not yet been glorified. His spirit was not omnipresent. His spirit could not be living in them, but the spirit was there with them because Jesus was with them. And in the future, when he sent this other comforter, that spirit would be in them. So once you begin to understand certain background information, it makes perfect sense. Jesus is saying, I'm going away, but I'm still going to be with you. I'm coming back in a different form. And he says it very clearly in verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. Don't worry yourselves, my children. Why are you so distressed? Don't I, you think I'm going to leave you? No, I will come to you. I'm going to be there. You just have to adjust your minds to see me in a different way. And this, 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 this is this is why this is what I want all of us to cherish this morning because this promise is just as real and as true for us as it was for those disciples. It's just as real and it's just as true. He is with us, he promised, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. And we have this person living with us and in us. He goes on to explain some more in verse 19. In a little while, the world is going to see me no more. Why? Because all the world can do is see the bodily form of Jesus. The world does not know his spirit. See what he says in verse 17? It seeth him not, neither knoweth him. If Jesus were to come and talk to, to somebody from the world, they would think it's a ghost, right? They would think, they would think, what are these voices? Or even if he comes and speaks in their heart, speaks in their hearts, they will think it's their own imagination. They don't know the voice of Christ. Wayne is trying to fix his electric wire, and 220 volts passes through and nearly destroys his knife, and he doesn't get touched. And um, the person who does not know Jesus says, man, I was so lucky. The person in Christ stands up to speak of the protection of Jesus. They know him. And so they can see him. But Jesus says, the world will see me no more. But you see me or you will see me. Do we see Jesus? Do we know Jesus? Can we discern his voice? Can we? Can we feel his presence in our lives? And listen to what he says. Because I live, you shall live also. There's a complete sermon in that one sentence. Because what it says is that the people that Jesus was speaking to were not yet alive. They were not living. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Simon, Bartholomew, Philip, all of them, they were not yet living. 
even though they had been casting out devils, raising the dead, healing the sick, teaching and following Jesus for three and a half years, they were not yet alive. They did not yet possess spiritual life. And this was not to happen until Jesus sent a comforter. Because I live, you shall live, future tense, you shall live also. At that day, in that day, you are going to know something. You are going to learn something. And today, a vast number of Christians, our professing Christians, have not yet learned this truth. Jesus says, when that happens, that day, you're going to know something. What are you going to know? What are we going to know? I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. There is a trinity for you. Jesus in the Father, the Father in Jesus, and Jesus in us. Three persons mentioned there, the Father, the Son, and you. There's not a third entity called a third member of the Godhead. Because that so-called third member of the Godhead is simply an aspect of Jesus and the Father. The spirit of Jesus, just like you have a spirit. All of us, when our spirits come together, Father, Son, and me, three spirits, three entities living in one body. Jesus says, thou in me and I in them, that they may be made perfect in one. This is the miracle that produces the new birth. This is a new covenant where God puts himself, his laws in our hearts and in our minds, and we are born again and we become the new creation because God and his son are living inside of us. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what makes us a son of God because we have his very life in us. And the problem is that the Christian world says it's a third entity. They have taken Jesus out of it and they have taken the Father out of it and they have given us a third entity who was not human, who never died for my sins, who never experienced humanity, who does not know what it is to sit in, in my place and to feel my, my concerns. And so I can't empathize if I'm dealing with somebody that I don't know. So, this brings us to the end of our time for this morning. There are a few more verses, but they, 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 let me just read the last um, strong point. Where Judas says unto him, that's not Judas Iscariot, that's the other Ju Judah, Judas, are, are, are called Jude. Lord, how is it? Notice the question is how. How is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? You notice that they kind of understand what Jesus is saying. They understand that he's saying, you are going to see me. They know it is Jesus, but they can't figure out how, how they are going to see Jesus and nobody else can see him because they are still not yet on the spiritual wavelength. They are still thinking carnally, physically. But they know it's Jesus. His words are clear to them. How are we going to see you and nobody else will see you? And Jesus makes it absolutely clear. He says, if a man love me, he will keep my words, keep my commandments, love one another and the rest of it. Consequently, my father will love him. I thought God loved everybody. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. They will come live at your yard, as we say in Jamaica, come live at my yard. But he says, my father will love him. And I, 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 I cherish this. I cherish this. My father will love him. Look here. I don't know about the rest of you, but that is going to be me. You know some verses in the Bible that turn me on? <laughs> God says of David, he's a man after my own heart. Wow. I would love to be their father. God says of Abraham, Abraham, my friend, my goodness gracious. Can that be me? Jesus, John says of himself, there was one disciple that Jesus loved. Wow, 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 wow. Those verses turn me on. Because Amen, not, Brother David. Amen. Yes. Amen. Sir. These are not arbitrary statements. They are statements that indicate there are qualities in these people that turn God on. Wow. 
wow, I, 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 I need, I need to find what it is. And Jesus tells you here, if a man loves me and keeps my word, my father will love him. God loves the world. God loves everybody. But there are certain things that endear people to God in a special way. And that privilege is, is before all of us. It's not arbitrary. It's, it's how we respond to God. It's how we respond to God and God's love that opens the door for that love to be to come back to us in a special way. And that's our privilege. Je Jesus says, my father and I will come and make our home with such a person. So I'm going to stop here for this morning, but it's really wonderful what God has done for us and what God has promised to do. And it's the, the, the most amazing and the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful thing is that the, this privilege is for every one of us, brothers and sisters. There are no exceptions and no specialties. What we will obtain is for all of us if we simply respond to that love God has poured out in Jesus. So thank you all for your attentiveness. Um, I, if there's anybody who wants to say one thing, I'll allow one person to say something. My time is up, but I'll, I'll allow one person if anybody has a question. All right, we're going to close with prayer. I have a question. Yes, go ahead, Sister Margaret. Um, Jesus, um, you said, look like the Father. And we have a description of Jesus, so it, would that be the same description of the Father? Yes, if we understand that what we're talking about is the spiritual or the character description. Certainly, we're not talking about Jesus' physical features, you know, his height, the, 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 the color of his skin. All of this is immaterial because this, is a, this would be a carnal understanding. But when he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, it means we look at his character, we look at, it, we look at his, his, his spiritual nature, we see how he dealt with people, and we say, that is God. So I can look at Jesus, and I can take that to the bank when I'm dealing with God. And I'll tell you, when you understand this, you're not afraid of him anymore. And even when you do something wrong, when you mess up, you're not afraid anymore. Because you see him in the face of Jesus Christ, and you know that when you fail as his child, one time I was looking for the big stick. I was looking to be spanked when I did wrong. But now I see him in the face of Jesus. When I, when I fail, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for the arms that go around my shoulders and the voice that says, I understand. We'll do better next time. That's what I see in the face of Jesus Christ. God has done something for me that tells me once more that, you know, I, 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 I have always convinced that I am his. But in a way, he did manifest his love towards me this week. And the long and short of my experience is this. Um, on Thursday, um, I was at home here uh, doing a bit of uh, repair uh, and improvement. And, and this involved a bit of electrical work. So I was uh, cutting an electric, some electric wire. Right, and um, the, 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 the electric voltage here in, in the UK is 220 volts, very high voltage. And when I was cutting the electric wire, let me see the part of that. When I was cutting the, the, the electric wire, I lost, a bit, I lost focus and forgot that the wire was still plugged in into the main socket. And as I was cutting the wire with this knife here, as you will probably want to see the full effect now, this is what happened to the knife. Okay, they will show you now. Right? The, the voltage that passed from the wire to the knife did that damage to the wire, to the knife. And praise be to God, it didn't affect me. And I'm certain that if that electric process, that voltage had not, had gone to me personally, you would have only been hearing about me in today's worship. Somebody would be talking about me. And I am so, so thankful to the Lord for his presence that um, on Thursday afternoon when this all happened. 
and that scared me uh, that I can begin sharing love, just trying to love towards me, towards my family, towards us all. Um, and I, it just convinced me I want more. When God says, your, 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 his angels are, are put in charge over us on Thursday afternoon, the manifestation that he has fulfilled towards me, that his angels are truly in charge. And I just wanted to share that this one with everyone of God's love towards us. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Brother Wayne. Um, Mr. Charmaine, I'm going to share her poem here now. If there are words for him, then I don't have them. You see, my brain has not yet reached a point where it can form a thought that could adequately describe the greatness of my God. And my lungs have not yet developed the ability to release a breath with enough agility to breathe out the greatness of his love. And my voice. You see, my voice is so inhibited, restrained by human limits, that it's hard to even send a praise up. You see, if there are words for him, then I don't have them. My God, his grace is remarkable. Mercies are innumerable. Strength is impenetrable. He is honorable, accountable, favorable. He is unsearchable yet knowable, indefinable yet approachable indescribable yet personal he is beyond comprehension further than imagination constant through generations king of every nation but if there are words for him then i don't have them you see my words are few and to try to capture the one true god using my vocabulary would never do but I use words as an expression, an expression of worship to a saviour, a saviour who is both worthy and deserving of my praise. So I use words. My heart extols the Lord, blesses his name forever. He has won my heart, captured my mind and has bound them both together. He has defeated me in my rebellion, conquered me in my sin. He has welcomed me into his presence, completely invited me in. He has made himself the object of my sight, filling me with mercies in the morning, drowning me with grace in the night. But if there are words for him, then I don't have them. But what I do have is good news. For my God knew that man-made words would never do. For words are just tools that we use to point to the truth. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, as the word, living proof. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, giving nothingness formation. For by his word he sustains in the power of his name. For he is before all things, and over all things he reigns. Holy is his name. So praise him for his life, the way he persevered in strife, the humble son of God becoming the perfect sacrifice. Praise him for his death, that he willingly stood in our place, that he lovingly endured the grave, that he battled our enemy and on the third day rose in victory. He is everything that was promised. Praise him as your risen king. Lift your voice and sing, for one day he will return for us and we will finally be united with our saviour for eternity. Eternity. So it's not just words that I proclaim, for my words point to the word, and the word has a name. 
hope has a name. Joy has a name. Peace has a name. Love has a name. And that name is Jesus Christ. Praise his name forever.